desert plains of the outback to the Great Barrier Reef, meet the intriguing animals of Australia, nature's most unusual creatures. Next, on Animal Wonder Down Under. This is the first Australian marsupial to be sighted by the outside world. Now called the Tamar Wallaby, it was seen by the crew of a Dutch sailing vessel wrecked off the coast of Western Australia in 1629, over 150 years before Australia was colonised by Europeans. The sailors were astonished by the hopping animal which carried its young in a pouch. There are more than 200 species of marsupial in Australia, more than any other country in the world. They're called marsupials after the Latin word marsupium, meaning pouch. This pouch is just a fleshy cover for the milk nipples, and it varies from one species to another. Kangaroos and wallabies have a very definite pocket with an opening at the top, while other animals, such as the bandicoots, have their pouches opening from the rear. Some animals don't have a pouch as such at all, just an arrangement of nipples. The feature which sets marsupials apart from placental mammals is the way that they're born. In a semi-embryonic state, quite tiny, and usually without hind legs or tails. The mother gives no help at all. Using only its two front legs, the newly born embryo struggles upwards to the pouch. Once there, it fastens onto a nipple which swells and locks the baby into position. It will stay on this nipple and keep growing until it's old enough to leave the pouch. The young kangaroo born in this remarkable way is about two centimeters long and weighs a fraction of a gram. If it's a male, it will grow to a height of two meters and weigh up to 65 kilos. This program is going to concentrate on some very small marsupials, some of them only a few centimeters long. Most of them are hardly ever seen, either because they're nocturnal or else very rare. One of these is the red-tailed wombanker. When the first white settlers came to Australia, they set about clearing the forests. This made land available for farming, but it also started a process of reducing the natural bushland, which had been going on now for almost 200 years. As a result, many animal species have become rare. The Wombanka is now confined to one or two small colonies which live in patches of uncleared land in southwestern Australia. Fortunately, these few hectares of trees have been preserved because they contain a large number of shrubs, poisonous to cattle and sheep, but harmless to native animals. The area is now a wildlife reserve, much appreciated by the tree-climbing wombankers. The young are born in August, the Australian winter. This little mother has eight babies, just a few days old. There's no pouch, just a nipple for each baby. As you can see, they're really tiny, about an eighth of an inch long, about two and a half millimeters. They grow with amazing speed. University researchers found that at the end of August, two weeks after giving birth, captured female animals almost always carried eight babies, firmly attached to the nipples and protected by the mother's soft fur. Behind, developed. Mm -hmm. Don't know whether they have any claws. The animals are carefully examined and measured. Wait there for another few weeks yet. Already, after only two weeks, the young have grown to about a centimeter and have back legs and tails. At four weeks, they've grown dramatically. This is a typical little marsupial phenomenon. This tiny animal is carrying eight large babies, each now a good two centimeters long, with back legs and tails well developed. They occupy almost all of the available space on her body. 
and their combined weight is about equal to her own. They're still locked onto her milk nipples and she's feeding them all. Not only that, but she carries them with her wherever she goes. To replenish her milk supply, she needs food. She moves around from tree to tree, feeding on beetles, spiders, cockroaches and other small insects, often going down to the ground. The strength required to leap from tree to tree encumbered by eight large youngsters must be prodigious. If you look carefully, you'll catch glimpses of the babies grimly hanging on while mother frisks about in the tree 12 to 15 meters up in the air. The base of her tail is quite red, often blending well with the bark of trees. Eventually, the time comes when she just can't carry them round anymore, and she finds a convenient hole or crack in a tree to deposit the young while she hunts for food. They'll now start to grow fur, and eventually they'll emerge into the open to start the next generation. Males only live for one breeding season, and females not much longer, so each generation is almost totally replaced by the next. Animal Wonder Down Under will be right back. Tonight at 9, journey coast to coast on Frontiers of White. Who are you going to call the most this month? The most? Good question. Isabel. With Sprint's new program, The Most, first, you get 20% off whoever you call the most each month. Second, you get 20% off calls to any of the millions of other Sprint customers automatically. Sprint interrupts this commercial for a special announcement. An independent consumer group has announced that of unrestricted plans, The Most from Sprint often offers the best savings with the fewest restrictions. Fisher-Price Activity Lynx Gym has six detachable toys, which means the only thing permanently attached to it is the baby. Why is the doughboy tooting his own horn? It's Pillsbury Baked Tops. A jazzy way to top your cake before it bakes. First, the crumbly chocolate streusel bakes in. Then, the dangerously delicious glaze drizzles on which means you can serve it while it's still hot. Cool. Pillsbury Bake Tops. <laughs> They'll blow you away. I see her. This is not a drill. Serve her away. This is what we do every day in the Coast Guard. Be part of the action. Call now, toll free. Coming up. They're cute cuddly and dangerously unpredictable. Travel north to the Arctic Circle for the adventure of a lifetime. Dwarfed by mountainous glaciers, working in sub-zero temperatures, one family attempts to befriend the Arctic's most fearsome scavenger. Don't miss their incredible Arctic Odyssey on Challenge. Tonight at 8 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. Sunday. It's heroes and legends from American history. First, hold back time with William Wyler's classic documentary of patriotism and valor. Take off with the invincible Memphis Belle. Then, honor the man who discovered America. At 10, old world experts ask where Columbus's remains lie. And at 10.30, meet modern revelers keeping his memory alive. Sunday, beginning at 9 Eastern, we now return to Animal Wonder Down Under. To continue the marsupial life cycle, we move to a very different type of forest only a few kilometers away. This is a eucalypt forest containing white gum, known locally as wandu. The wandu forest is littered with fallen trees and branches, and it's rare to find a piece of wood not being demolished by termites. Termites are the main source of food for the Australian spiny anteater, or echidna, which lives in rocky outcrops in the forest. Despite its appearance, the echidna is no relation to the porcupine. It only has one relative in the world, the platypus. The platypus and the echidna 
are the only mammals in the world to lay eggs. The echidna shares the forest and its food with another specialist eater of termites, a rare and beautiful animal called the numbat. Numbats are only found in isolated parts of Western Australia. A few years ago, they were almost extinct, but now they're steadily building up in numbers. They usually have four babies in a very rudimentary pouch. These babies are already furred, and they leave the pouch quite soon, although they're not fully weaned for some months afterwards. Numbats usually live in a hollow log, although they sometimes prefer a burrow, especially in hot weather. We're watching this log because a female numbat went into it last night. Unlike most marsupials, numbats sleep at night and they feed during the daytime, so there's a good chance she'll still be there. It's five minutes to ten on a cool spring morning. There's been no movement around the log since first light at six. The entrance is dark and we can't see in, but the numbat can see out. She's waiting until she considers it warm enough for the young to emerge. Here she comes. Because we're watching, she senses that things aren't quite the same as usual, but she isn't sure what the difference is. She goes through her investigatory routine. Before long, she'll leave the log and forage for food to replenish her milk supply. Now this will take all day and she'll have to leave the children at home. So she has to make sure all is safe. Now, here come the children. Quick, jerky movements. They're not accustomed yet to much moving around. These are rare and endangered animals and it really is a privilege to be able to watch them like this in their natural surroundings. Instinct makes them stay very close to the front door of their house. Their only chance for escape from a sudden predator lies in their ability to get back into the log at top speed. A few weeks later, the babies have grown considerably and they're much more self-confident. Even so, they're always aware of danger. They move further away from the nesting log and start foraging for food themselves. They use their front legs to dig termites out of rotted branches and logs, and they also scoop them out of the ground, intercepting galleries leading from mounds. They have a very long tongue, which flicks in and out among the termites, which stick to the saliva and are swallowed whole. A female numbat suckling four young will eat up to 120 grams or 45,000 termites per day. From the Wandu forest of Western Australia, we travel to the opposite side of the continent for a fascinating member of the possum family. This is the yellow-bellied glider, one of several species of gliding possum. Gliders are another specialized animal with a diet mainly consisting of nectar and pollen and sap from eucalypt trees. Occasionally they eat insects as well. They spend most of their time up in trees and they're very well equipped for moving from one tree to another. They have a web of skin between their limbs, which can be extended to form a sort of rectangular sail, 
Using this, they can glide up to 100 meters. Wonder Down Under will be right back. Was it eons of isolation from the rest of the world? Or was it the way the wind blew? Or the way the rain fell? Was it the angle of the sun? Or was it a bird blown of course that found its way here with a single seed that grew? change the course of history. Somehow, we just evolve differently. Australia, feel the wonder. For your free 130-page travel planner, call 1-800-395-7000. How often do you get the chance to fly Qantas? With more than 40 flights a week to Australia and the South Pacific, including more non-stops with morning and evening departures, Quite often, actually, we go further. Qantas. Fisher Price makes the night a little brighter with the Puffle on Snuggle Light. She's soft, cuddly, and best of all, when you hug her, her face lights up, and so does somebody else's. Imagine a place full of magic and wonder, where kids explore worlds all over and under. A place for your family called HBO. Imagine a place for kids who have grown with tales of adventure and teens on their own. A place where knowledge and ideas can flow. A place for life's lessons every family should know. Imagine one place where you can go, a world that inspires a desire to grow. HBO. CBS presents 10 days, 30 movies, one man, John Wayne. This is where we separate the men from the boys. Oh, there must be some mistake here. You made it. Oh! America's hero. Come and get it, boy! 10 days of the Duke, October 31st through November 9th on TBS. We now return to Animal Wonder Down Under. We're back on the west coast now, in a regenerated forest formerly stripped for bauxite mining. To encourage birds to nest in the young trees which haven't yet had time to develop convenient holes, the mining company has installed a number of nesting boxes. Use this piece of cardboard and cover the entry hole up so that they escape the one around the back. No birds have taken advantage of this service yet, but some little animals have. There he is, little fella. This is the western pygmy possum. It lives mainly in trees and is very rarely seen because of its nocturnal habits. For all that, it's quite common. This is a breeding pair and they're very sleepy at the moment, having been disturbed during the day. 
the prehensile tail curls up neatly in repose. Another daytime sleeper is the Western Australian honey possum. It sleeps in a curled up leaf or borrows an abandoned bird's nest. It isn't a possum at all, really. Like the numbat, it's a highly specialized animal and it's the only member of its family, which makes it scientifically very important. It's a tiny animal. Males weigh up to seven grams and females up to 12. And it lives entirely on pollen and nectar. It only lives in southwestern Australia, mainly in the Fitzgerald National Park, which contains a higher plant diversity than any other place on the globe. In any selected area, about the size of a small room, you can find up to 130 different plants. The honey possum feeds mainly on Banksia and Dryandra flowers. While feeding, it cross-pollinates them. Most unusual for a mammal. So there's a relationship between the plants and the animals. The animals need the food, and the plants need to be cross-fertilized. Because the various species have an overlapping flowering schedule, sufficient food is available throughout the year. These are grains of pollen from the Banksia flower. Pollen grains are quite distinctive when seen through an electron microscope, and samples of pollen from the animal's fur or whiskers can give an accurate assessment of which flowers they prefer. This is a male animal. He may roam up to several kilometers per year in search of food. but some of the females, which weigh a little more, may remain quite sedentary near good food supplies, moving only a few meters over 12 months. He's licking pollen off the flower here with his highly specialized tongue. It's worth stopping here for a moment and looking at some pictures from the electron microscope. First, though, here's a view of his hard palate. You'll notice the rows of white, bone-like crescents. These are toothed combs. Now, here's the tip of the tongue, which has a complex system of papillae, rather like a little mop. Further back, and extending almost to the extreme rear of the tongue, smaller papillae, resembling short brush bristles, collect pollen as the animal licks the flower stamens. Further back still, the papillae become more complex. As the tongue retracts into the mouth, the brushes scrape along the serrated comb teeth on the hard palate, and the pollen is removed. And when the tip of the tongue is fully retracted, the mop is squeezed, as it were, and nectar is reclaimed. On its way forward again, the tongue brushes contact bony ridges set in the opposite direction to the combs, and any remaining pollen is scraped off. So the hard palate is contoured for removing pollen on both forward and backward movements of the tongue. Now this is a very close view of the teeth of the palate combs. It's a complex structure in a tiny area and stamps the honey possum as unique in the world. 
Despite being restricted to particular habitat areas because of specialized diet requirements, the honey possums appear to be a flourishing and healthy species. for a brief glimpse of the most rarely seen animal in Australia, the marsupial mole. It has its counterpart in the placental mole of other countries, but its diet and habits are different. It so rarely leaves its underground habitat that no one knows when or where to expect it. Almost nothing is known about it, except that it travels just centimeters beneath the ground, and it does this by a swimming motion helped by flattened claws. Its tunnels are not permanent like the placental moles, and the earth fills in behind it as it travels. It's believed to eat insect larvae of various kinds. Perhaps one day, research will fill in some of the unknowns, not only of this animal, but many others in this huge country. We've seen just a few of the little marsupials of Australia. Different in size, behavior, diet and habitat. Just why these animals and many others in this country should be marsupials is still not clear. But there's no doubt that Australian marsupials are successful animals, specialized for the environment and largely unique.